Now, when we rotate it like this, this um, we might take this methyl group. and have it pointing towards us. Mm -hmm. But which way will this methyl group be pointing towards us? Also towards us. I think that originally you thought that they would be pointing trans to each other. But in the original picture that's in the plane of the page, both methyl groups are cis, so they should stay cis. Okay. It's just that we're changing their orientation. Also, right now, they would be horizontal. So this wedge shouldn't really be pointing significantly up or down. It should just be pointing to the left, and this should be pointing to the right. Now we're going to form the epoxide. Well, if the oxygen comes in from above, now that would point, push both of these substituents down. So now they can be pointing down. All right. But they're still cis to each other, in a sense. They're still both on wedges. The oxygen is pushing these down, but it's not changing them from wedges to dashes. Okay. Well, this is the answer. Are you, you're not going to, uh, are you going to get, that would be the major product. Would you even get the other uh, attacking from the other side because of the cis? Attacking from the other side. Well, the two sides here are attacking from above or below. Oh, okay. so and neither of those is hindered. Okay. Remember, that's why it's important to draw these pointing straight out right and left. Okay. So in a sense, you, you might have been thinking that the front was hindered. Yeah. But what we are comparing here is attacking from above or from below. Oh, right. So we could also attack from below. But that's just going to give us the same thing we already had. Okay. If we attack from below, we would get this. But if, if we simply rotate this 180 degrees, that would be the same as this picture. So in this case, even though potentially we had the potential to get two different products, we really only got one okay. again. So I'll go ahead and erase this since this attack from below turned out to give us the same product as we had up here. So uh, the double bond is, so the, the molecule is, the methyl group are pointing towards us right now, right? In the starting material or in the product? The starting yeah, if you rotate the alkene like this, the two methyls right. are pointing towards you. So the double line is attacking from the back or the front? Uh, let's see, I'm not quite sure if I followed that. So the oxygen now is attacking either from above or from below. It's not going to attack from either in front or from behind. Oh, okay. So the oxygen could attack, say, from above. Okay. Like this. Or the oxygen could attack from below. Because those are the non-hindered faces. We don't, it's not going to attack from in front of the board or from behind the board. It's going to attack from on top, uh, above on the board or below on the board. But in this case, it doesn't matter whether it attacks from above or from below. We saw that gave us the same outcome either way. Again, I'm not sure that, it, even though it's possible to get two products when you form an epoxide, I didn't see your instructor ever talking about that. So we're not going to spend too much time on that. The important thing is to have in your notes the comparison of how it's a little bit trickier to draw the epoxide correctly based on an acyclic alkene than a cyclic. With, an a with a cyclic alkene, you simply put the epoxide oxygen on wedges or dashes. But there's a two-step process for acyclic alkenes. First, redraw the alkene so its substituents are on wedges or dashes, like this. And then they should just be pointing straight right or left. And then the oxygen will end up in the plane of the page. Whereas here the oxygen was on a wedge, here it's going to be in the plane of the page, and here the substituents are on the wedges and dashes. It just turns out that it's convenient to use two different methods for drawing epoxides from acyclic versus cyclic alkenes. And of course, we just need to have memorized that this is a per acid that's used for forming epoxides. Remember that we saw that the P stands for per and the A stands for acid. So it's a similar in form to this. Our new functional group today is epoxides, so we have to learn two things, how to synthesize them and then what we can do with them. Well, now we've learned one of the key ways to synthesize epoxides, so now we can go on to the reactions for epoxides, what you can do with them.
reaction can happen here? Well, are there any nucleophilic atoms around? Is there anyone here that we've learned can be a nucleophilic atom? Oxygen. Yeah. Which oxygen would you think might be the nucleophile here? In the epoxide or in the water? H2O. In the water. That's right. This has a lone pair, so it can be a nucleophile. Now, are there any electrophiles around? Who's the electrophilic atom in the epoxide? Who is our electrophilic atom in this epoxide? Carbon. Carbon. How do we know that it's electrophilic? Because of um, the inductive effect. That's right. That's a good start. Now, what does the inductive effect do? I think you're thinking about the fact that the oxygen is more electronegative than the carbon, so it's pulling the electrons closer to itself. The important upshot of that is that the carbon will end up with a delta positive charge. This is one of the most useful ways to identify electrophiles. We know that electrophiles tend to have positive charges and nucleophiles tend to have negative charges. Well, even just a delta positive can make something into a carbon electrophile. So here we have a carbon electrophile. Obviously, this carbon also is delta positive, so that could be a carbon electrophile as well. However, we have a couple of problems here. One problem is, as we were saying before, neutral oxygen is not a great leaving group. And another problem is that neutral oxygen is a nucleophile, but not a very good nucleophile. For example, we've learned that you can do SN1 reactions with neutral oxygen, but not SN2. So in fact, we're going to get no reaction here. This is not electrophilic enough to react with a, a, a poor nucleophile like this. We're going to have to do something to make these species more reactive in order to get a reaction here. Well, what could we do that would make this into a better electrophile, that would give this molecule a better leaving group and a better electrophile? We reviewed that yesterday. What can we add to the mix that would give us a better electrophile and leaving group here? Strong acid. An acid. Yesterday we spent time seeing how acids give you better, better electrophiles and better leaving groups. Now let's try to predict what's going to happen here with these reagents. Now we have not just the epoxide in water, but also an acid. Well, let's start by describing this in words. What would you say would happen first here in words? When you're ready. The uh, hydrosulfuric acid uh, would protonate the, uh, the oxygen. Which oxygen? Um, the, um, the ring. That's right. Yesterday we saw that if you have a strong acid, the first step should be easy. Anytime you have a strong acid, you must start by protonating somebody, almost with no exceptions. If there's a strong acid, you must start by protonating somebody. This is called sulfuric acid. Well, this is one of the acids we discussed yesterday as a common acid in OCAM. If you've got sulfuric acid, you must start by protonating somebody. And we talked about how you usually protonate somebody who's electronegative with a lone pair, particularly oxygens. You might try protonating the oxygen in the water, but that's not going to give us anything interesting because we want to use this as a nucleophile. It'll give us something more interesting to protonate this oxygen. So this is the oxygen we should protonate. In order to show the mechanism for that, you have to know what the structure of sulfuric acid looks like. Sulfuric acid is real important to know. Okay, I don't know if we had a chance to talk about this before, but it's important to know that this is the structure for sulfuric acid. We actually have to write this out so we can show the mechanism. And now we can show the protonation step. We have to draw in the lone pair on the oxygen because it's neutral. And that frees up these electrons. It's important to know what this protonation step looks like. Okay. Remember that the arrow should be pointing towards the hydrogen. We should not show, point, have the arrow pointing away from the hydrogen because the arrow is not supposed to show which way the hydrogen is moving. It's supposed to show which way these electrons are moving. That's a common mistake to have the arrow pointing away from the hydrogen that's protonating somebody. Now we should be able to draw the next intermediates based on those electron pushing arrows. What would our intermediates look like?
it's good that you got the charges right. The whole point of putting in the acid was to put this positive charge here, because as we discussed yesterday, positive charges give you better electrophiles and better leaving groups. This is how we're going to improve our reactivity. And it's good that you saw this now as a negative charge, 